Hello. Oh, guys. You've given the game away already. There are some actual humans in the room with me, um, which is lovely and a nice surprise. Uh, I don't know if, if, anyone's, um, if anyone's watching at home. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a room largely alone in the dark, um, talking to you with no idea if anyone's listening or will ever listen. Um, but that's really just a sort of normal day at the office for a poet, I think. We've been doing socially distanced gigs and gigs to which literally no one comes for millennia long before it was cool or uh, government mandated. So hopefully I've got this. Maybe I don't, but you know, that's the thrill of live theatre. If anyone is out there, thank you so much for tuning in. It means a lot that you decide to spend your Saturday night with me, even if your other options are legally severely limited at the moment. It still means an awful lot, so thank you. Um, to prove that we're live, I've brought in uh, one of today's newspapers. It just happens to have a headline that I find quite satisfying for reasons that will become clear later. But, you know, I work in theatre, so it should be pretty clear already. Um, I'm going to do a mixture of old and new pieces and some old pieces in uh, a new way. Um, it might all go horribly wrong, but then I hope you've been so starved of live entertainment that you'll be thrilled by anything happening at all. Uh, all of the pieces speak to a central theme in, in some way, and that theme is love. What kind of theme is love, I hear you cry, quietly, so as not to spray potentially deadly droplets everywhere. Surely every piece of writing ever speaks in some way to love. To which I would reply, mm, fair enough. But we're here now, aren't we? Right, tickets at the ready, please. Remember, if you pick out up, put it back before you go. Leave only footprints, tech only memories, etc, etc, and also stuff you've purchased from the gift shop. Management like me to get that in nice and early. Thank you very much. Right. Let's have ya. It's dusty on the way in, and drier than you expected, for now at least. Darker too than we're led to believe. More purple than red. Takes your eyes a few seconds to adjust. The walls are at least as alive as the man who tears your ticket. And you're ushered in. You're handed a short tour of the heart branded Deluxe Adult Rain Poncho, just in case. A sign reads, Please keep all arms, legs, heads and hopes inside the ventricle. We're not liable if any personal feelings taken with you today are damaged, lost or stolen. There are lockers if you'd like to ensure their safety. The lockers are out of order. You stand at the foot of a long corridor. You have paid for a guided tour. No one comes. You arrived with a party. No more than six, of course. You're not a twat. But now you are alone. There are childhood things about you. A Sheriff Woody toy with a string cord coming from his back like a mangy tail. You pull it. There is a snake in my boo. A small fluffy bunny with zealous ears and a stoic face. A button on its stomach. You push it. I lost myself in Tlangothlin. Okay. An animatronic figurine from a movie franchise you can't remember. It seems to be some kind of period Sherlock type thing. Fin de siècle. On closer inspection, it is a tiny... Robert Frost. In his hand is an even tinier laser pen, made to look like a quill. Some serious historical liberties have been taken here. You fire it at the wall. Poetry begins in delight and ends in wisdom. The figure is the same for love. No one can really hold that the ecstasy should be static and stand still in one place. It begins in delight. It inclines to the impulse. It assumes direction with the first line laid down. 
It runs a course of lucky events and ends in a clarification of life. Not necessarily a clarification such as sects or cults are founded on, but in a momentary stay against confusion. It has denouement. Strange gift for a child, but sure. Next to this is a Martin Carter figurine from the same manufacturer. It looks like they came as part of a set. You like the idea that there is a world in which poets are figurine worthy, superheroes, even though it is not your world. You put him in the pocket of your poncho. It really is deluxe. You'll come back to it later. If his quote is anything like Frost's, then you need a minute. Up ahead is a climbing frame. 90s early learning classic. Primary colors, an optional tarpaulin hood for inclement weather or nefarious activity. Carved onto the blue plastic slide, thick as a spade, is some writing. In the timeless so-and-so loves so-and-so school, but running all the way down like the thought itself is playing. When we talk about our first kisses, we're talking about our first snogs, aren't we? Not that we'd have called it that then. Nor French, nor Pash, God no. We said, get off. Did you get off with him? And then later just get with, which had helpfully porous borders. Then later still, the Americanism made out made its way in. Do you make out? Yeah, we made out for hours. But I remember my first kiss, not my first snog, a cine world back row washing machine that covered neither of us in glory, just saliva. My first kiss. I was about five, so it was a peck, obviously, but it wasn't a family member, nor a close family friend under duress from a family member. Next door neighbor, a couple years older. Climbing frame with the cover on. Hot day, but we were deep in some cosplay. King and queen. Heteronormative. Royalist. Doubly problematic. But we were five, so really, you should be looking at yourselves here, boomers. Mum. Well, I was five. She was seven. Legend. What do king and queens do? We asked ourselves earnestly. This wasn't, I'm sure of it, a ruse. Strangely adult kids when there's no adults there to referee that shit. And a strangely adult kiss. We might have even married, and we wanted to get it right. We were as comprehensive as our knowledge of love allowed. I was so desperate to be seen to know things, and so terribly, terribly serious. What's new? Then the path diverges. One way to the left is adolescence. Laminated Man United players give way to veiny cartoon cocks on the covers of exercise books, goalkeeper gloves, suspension letters and final warnings, catcher in the rye and poetry live, high school sweethearts, and scores of train tickets when you collected them like football stickers or gig memorabilia, not tax receipts. Lots of the words I know and I promise, and not I hope or I wish. Lots of the word forever before you realized just how long that is. An awful lot of ink. The solemnity of an early career singer-songwriter. Next to this is 17 seconds of pro wrestling footage being played on loop on a retro box TV, screen smaller than it is deep, above which are written the words, your identity. A bit on the nose, you think, but it is this curator's first time putting together an exhibition on this scale. There will, as ever, be teething problems. Next to this hangs an equal opportunities monitoring form on a large pink bulldog clip. It says, completely attached and return. I worry that I am not actually bisexual. I just want to have something to tweet about. Working class regional queer with mental health problems is a more fashionable crime than middle class straight white boy, the middle class straight white boy in me says. But I do fancy men, and I am sad, and we aren't slash weren't rich. I went to a school comprehensive only in name, whose riches were folkloric. A battery farm on a Siberian hill, we wanted dry land and break time. Frozen football pitches, men with lighters and some it to prove. 
How queer. We had more floods slash fires in five years than classes on long division. Sent more boys to prison than to Oxbridge. A crime in and of itself. So many things should slash can be criminal. A cake in the right mouth if too rich. Ditto naughty slash wicked slash filthy slash that's cricket. Ditto top class. Top of the class is a relative term. I could show you some things if you want. Give you more floorboards than carpets, more queries than answers. Get off your knees. Paint me a picture of a man that's so comprehensive I'll wonder if I've slash you've ever met a man. Send me a survey, monkey. Ask me British slash English. A crime within a crime. The first person I told I was queer was an equal opportunities monitoring form. The richest irony. I waited for them to email back. Congrats! I wanted it that bad. But I was onto the section about class. Hovering over spaces like a bird above glass. Deciding, trying to decide on which masculinity I could land today. Wanting just to land on the ground. To scrub grime from my body. Wanting to feel rich and a man and queer. To be with a woman and still be queer. To be comfortable and not transcend my class. To be rich and not be rich. To be a man and not a man. And for that not to be a crime to other men who want nothing of me but straight riches, no queerness. Who won't proposition me from inside my own upheaval or want classes on being less or more of a man or a performance or a crime. I sometimes volunteer for this wonderful charity called the Good Lad Initiative, who run a project called Great Men, and they go into schools and do workshops, mostly secondary schools, sometimes universities, do workshops with young boys on masculinity, uh, talking about gender equality, gently suggesting that it didn't begin and end with the suffragettes, um, and there might still be some distance to run, um, and, um, and talk, talk to them in general about how their identities intersect and might intersect with others. We talk about consent, we talk about trans rights and general LG LGBTQ issues. It's a really wonderful program and a privilege to be a part of and, um, and mostly very rewarding, but obviously sometimes it gives rise to certain challenging conversations or, you know, surprising and, and not very savory viewpoints, but that's kind of the point and, you know, it's valuable because of that. But yeah, there can be frustrating days as much as life affirming days. Um, so this is a poem after a poem by Kim Moore called The Trumpet Teacher's Curse, called A Curse on the Boys. A curse on the boys who don't listen, who giggle at the mention of gender as if it's something they don't have. The boys who go limp when they see the word feminism, the only real F word round here. The boys drawing dicks on the board for days. They lock their mums in kitchens, their wives in bedrooms, and themselves in boardrooms and on trading floors. These one-man travel corridors. Funny how quickly buying and selling starts to look like flailing, like semaphore for help. A curse on those who don't ask for it. A curse on the private schoolers who should know better, whose parents' wealth can't buy them courtesy or even proper knowledge. Gazing at the old girl's place over the fence, asking only how not to get accused of anything. Arming themselves for the joint sixth form, the rape jokes, the alibis and the circuitous routes. A curse on those who can spell everything but paternity, for whom leave only means one thing. A curse on those who won't let a bathroom be a bathroom, who want to own everything. May you be flaccid forever. May you never know the right time to leave the party. May you draw a cock and balls whenever you try and sign your name, write a check, give someone your number. I wish you constantly underwhelming punchlines. Sorry I've got an early mornings. The kids won't see you anymores. I wish you phallic hatchbacks with flaccid roof racks and a first kiss curse of fetid tic tacs. I wish you haunting flashbacks, a parade of former partners all yawning mid shag. I wish you lukewarmly received TEDx talks, copyright-free instrumental music. May your whole life feel like an impressive lift journey, going up and up and up and up and up and up, but may your stomach stay put.
May you never be invited to play in Soccer Raid. May you know just once what it's like to need to be somewhere that you're not and can't get to. May you feel just once unwelcome. May you feel just once unsafe. I wish you so much money, you run out of places to put it. I wish you slow punctures on performative charity bike rides, dodgy shellfish and patchy Wi-Fi. I wish you long journeys for largely unsuccessful hair transplants, substandard private dementia care. I wish you let wet laybys and missed bedtimes, frozen PowerPoints and difficult second albums. Fuck, I wish you difficult first albums. I wish you would help me do something with this anger the impossible maleness of this poem. I wish we knew the difference between revenge and reparations. I'm not shouting. I wish us freedom and peace and patience and pause. The power to say, I don't know. And for those who did go to private school, obviously I wish them radically higher taxation and the complete dissolution of those institutions in their, in their entirety. To the right is a blank section of wall. There is a patch of lighter purple where an exhibit has been removed, rehomed later, according to a note written is what, in what is clearly Sharpie. Scattered on the floor are critical theory texts, water bills, a Meccano model of a burnt out sixth form center, profit share theater, the detritus of 171 house parties, miraculously a degree certificate, and a tenancy agreement concerning a small room in a small flat in a place that one estate agent had the brass balls to call London. The paths converge again at a portrait of an old woman smirking, shriveled and provocative, like an embattled raisin. She is staring down the barrel of the canvas, looking somehow mean, rock and roll, wry and warm all at once. This woman is your grandmother. There's a pair of headphones hanging next to the portrait. You put them on. Good morning everyone, welcome to London St Pancras International. The train on platform 4 is the 10.05 East Midlands Railway Service to Nottingham, calling at Luton Airport, Parkway, Bedford, Wellingborough, Kettering, Market Harbour, Leicester, Luga Baruga, Beeston and Nottingham. If you are intending to travel on this service, please board the train now as it is ready to leave. The air smells different up here. Like someone has taken a layer off it. The world's had its windows open. You don't know this smell until you've floated in the fog of London for a bit. Stop smelling it as fog. And when you stop cycling behind a bin lorry for two miles down the Holloway Road most mornings, you stop smelling everything, really. Or you have a new normal. So what was normal, at 25 years normal, is now extraordinary. <clears throat> the East Midlands. Yeah. It's so much passed through. I could close my eyes. You could transport me here from anywhere on earth. I could breathe in once and tell you. <sniffs> Knots. I'd call it by its name. Home. Well, the family house now sold, so I'm sofered when I'm back. An imposition in my own town. But it's my hometown. I step onto the station and feel that shameful pride. The expat's stomach leap and fold. Emperor and alien all at once. The high of the familiar, the guilt at having left. The notion that you've made it like some thin Dickensian wisp. That sweet and simple myth. The knowledge that you haven't made anything. This the only place that knows your muddy knees before the clean. That you had to go unchild yourself. You're happy to be Nottingham's expert elsewhere. 
But each return brings one new shop, a switched bus route, some minuscule upheaval, like seeing a former partner's new haircut on Facebook. My A up to the woman in the concourse Costa sounds a bit token. I tiptoe to the tram stop as if I'm scared to wake the proper knots gods, clutching my latte like a peace offering. Hot prayer. Hobnob. I'm back for Christmas and for Gran. She's in the Queen's Med and she's going to die. She's there in a, what was it? Not coming out sort of way, Mum said. She's not. She's fine. We've been here before. Gran fell last week, Mum said. It might have been a stroke or general dehydration, but she can't remember how she fell or falling, where the pain was, if there was pain. Why? Just the fact of the floor and then all these new strangers, same as the old strangers, and us, the newest kind of stranger, her family. F-18 is at the top, a flawless panorama of the hospital car park, and the tram tracks and three boarded up pubs, but the day pouring itself away behind them in a gorgeous long gold backlight. Gran is looking at me, looking at the view, waiting for me to translate it for her. So I say, it's all right, it's the best I can do. And then she asks me to move the curtains to shield her eyes. I put my get well card on the side because she will, and I sit, and the hospital happens around us. It's nice, best I can do. No one comes to introduce themselves or tell me how she's doing, and I'm glad. I will sit here and I will hold her hand and I will decide for myself how she's doing. The size and squeeze of her grip, the rate of the strokes from her thumb, the fruit in her cough and the whip of her wit. How many times from absolutely nowhere she says, oh, bugger this, or spare me. I will decide the way you have to study a lifetime to know. And I know, she looks great. Color in her cheeks, sparkle in her eye and all the other guff. Full house, the best she's been in years. And I told you, I told her, Gran is fine. It's nothing that a steady drip and a few days kip won't fix. Just needs to get her fluids up. Mum has an agenda, that's all, to wash her hands of her and this. Not for the cash, I don't think, although mum's Snenton bedsit is a far cry from where she used to live, a house. But because it's effort, innit? Gran's in and out and in and out. Hospital, nursing home, back. Rinse, lather, repeat. Her dying now would be a release for mum. Convenient. They've got her name above her bed. Muriel Morrison, vegetarian. No custard. No gravy. All the important stuff. Makes me smile. Stubborn enough, even now, to put taste before blood type. Especially now. I mean, if she's going to die, which she's not, she might as well do it eating something she likes. I read her a bit from her book. She's halfway through, and I wonder how much she's read herself or remembers. But it doesn't matter, because the act of me reading brings her joy. And I recall something Jackie Kay said about Alzheimer's that it's a series of moments, and we should aspire to move from one joyous moment to another. And Gran is laughing and enjoying the book, which is a good thing because I realize after the first three paragraphs I read to her that I hate her book. It's like a budget Bill Bryson, and it's impressively misogynistic for something ostensibly about narrowboats. But I read on because it's calming her down, and the hand I'm still holding has quieted, and she's happy, I think, or not unhappy. So I'm happy too. Or not unhappy. When I was little, I couldn't pronounce the liquid U in Muriel. So I called her Moo. Like a Welsh boy. Bootiful. Or a stupid American. And then my brother and all the cousins followed suit. I think about changing the name on her board or adding a boxer or snooker player style middle bit in inverted commas. Alex the Hurricane Higgins. The Rocket Ronnie O'Sullivan. Carl the Cobra. Frotch. Muriel Moo Morrison. Eventually lunch comes round. No gravy or custard for Gran. Thank Christ or shit would kick off. 
The doctors want to know if I can help with the stroke or not stroke question. They asked me to look at her, and I do. And has anything changed? I see a face like a fallen over shower gel, all poured to one side. And for a second, I can't remember if any of this is normal gran. I know nothing about her then. And in my head, she smiles at me and winks and says, me neither. Laughs her aeroplane propeller laugh, 40 a day. And I say, no, nothing's changed. It doesn't matter about your age, the city you live in today, you play Gran's game with a smile and a slice of cake. Yes, Gran, Birmingham's great. I haven't lived there for four years. Cardiff the same, another two years. <laughs> but I live there again. Sometimes she's right, remembers it's the smoke now, but regardless, you play. And I do, always. Sit back and smile while she does her comedy frown. She looks like the old man from Up, eyebrows buried in her mouth. It's brilliant. She's a clown. This is the woman I know. Putting me in my place. Offering me an ill-fitting anorak of myself, which I gladly wear. Inching my arms into the past. Sometimes I'm Matt or Mike, her two sons, one dead. Sometimes I'm Peter, her late husband. But I don't mind. She knows that I'm somewhere. My coffee is cold now, but it's something to hold. The sun has slipped turning the car park from Amber Ale to Guinness. She says, don't go. And I say, I'm not, don't worry. Look, I'll, I'll leave my bag here, I'm just going for a wee. And I go to the toilet and cry. Stew, mule. And I text my mum and say, what the hell? This is not a woman ready to die. The Doobie Brothers are playing from a tinny speaker in the corner. Why is the radio on in the toilet? This isn't Top Man. Muriel, my munificent tutor, now a furious new tune. Your head a nuclear bureau, or mute dune. Your speech a musical cue, fugue. Stupid funereal nuisance, it's abuse. Cucumber sandwiches, diminutive ambulances. We refugees, Muriel. We unusual duo. Hospitals smell like hospitals, don't they? But when I'm back outside, I remember where I am. Get into my stride a little bit. Rise to meet the city. It's lift and it's gate. I stay with a mate. Can't see mum. She's ill, but I don't want to anyway. And there's nowhere to sleep at her place. The floor next to a fridge isn't great. The next day, I am late. Moo is in a new room now. New view. Her own room. The city a wave crashing over a hill. Lights petering out like a thinning film of water. My little brother is here. His first time back in even longer. Literally years. He left for uni. Me already gone. And then mum left dad. Just like that. The kids good and raised. So Chris departed hard. Did most of his growing up out of their sight out like even of mine so i'm standing opposite a boy or a man i barely know over a woman i barely recognize gran is worse today i think it's just because i've come later that happens doesn't it to dementia patients it's fine isn't it when i was little i couldn't pronounce the liquid u in muriel and now chris and i both struggle with the liquid moo instead standing dusty, bookend stiff beside her bed, using each other's names as often as possible, louder than required, to remind us all. Catching up over her like Piggy in the middle, hoping that to watch us talk counts as talking too. Throwing her scraps of our lives. Chris is getting fat, he says. There are too many biscuits in the office. Absolute classic. I fell in a canal, I tell her, which is true. And I laugh at myself a bit too hard like an actor fighting to do the audience's work. The liquid you, one moment saint, then swearing like a sailor, then sunk, silent, simian slump, a puncture, only skin, sundowning. That's the word, isn't it? 
for why they're worse later in the day. Their brain goes to bed before their body. Hey, Moo. We say we've got to go, even though we don't. I soft at the door as if she's sleeping and look at her looking out the window. She's so small, helpless as a baby without any of the hope. It's pitch black now, the city like the cracked screen of a phone. Someone I went on a date with two months ago messages me to say, Merry Christmas, and I reply and say, thank you, and to you too. And she writes back and says, go on then, tell me about your Christmas morning. I love hearing about people's Christmas morning traditions. And I think, well, I wake up whenever. I look around to see where I've had to spend it this year. I dress and try not to cry. and Maybe I eat a crumpet, attempting to be grateful for things, but mostly thinking about betrayal. I don't say this, though. I just say I don't really have any anymore. <laughs> it's a bit complicated, isn't it? You? And she tells me about her idyllic Christmas morning, like she's fallen straight from the Enid Blyton novel on Theresa May's bedside table. And her whole life is illustrated by Raymond Briggs and baked by Mary Berry. And her kitchen, I've seen from a picture she sent me in an earlier message, is the size of Wembley Arena and presently the site of an industrial mince pie making operation. Here is a woman who lives, laughs and loves. And I hate her and I want her whole house to burn down. But of course I just say, oh, that sounds really nice. I'm dead jealous, because <laughs> it's true. Mum is still quite fluey when she rings me. Sounds like she's holding her nose and has been punched in the stomach and is incredibly far away, but I can still tell something's wrong because I say, Mummy, which I never call her. And she says in a tiny voice that Gran has died. She died at seven, no one was there, but Matt had been in earlier, so, so that, that was nice. She just stopped breathing, the hospital said, and that was it. She says, I'm sorry, Sammy, which she always calls me, and I say I'm sorry too, and I don't know what we've both done wrong. I call Chris and tell him Gran's gone, and he sounds the most adult he's ever sounded. He leaves silences, and he doesn't seem in a hurry to get off the phone, and then I'm the one wrapping things up, because I'm so wrong-footed by his desire to stay on the phone. <laughs> he grows up 10 years in a single call. When the news of her death is public, by which I mean I've written an ill-advised Facebook status about it, I'm inundated with well-meaning condolences, all of which I appreciate on some level, but about 3% of which I find actually consoling. People keep calling her things other than Gran. Nana, Nan, Granny, Nanny, Nana. All lovely stuff, like, but none of these things were her name. It was Gran on my mum's side and Nan on my dad's. Those are their names, as concrete for me as if they'd been on their birth certificates, passports, carved in stone. Here lies Gran, it should say, Moo. And everyone should know who that is. Immediately after getting off the phone, I text mum a series of dates I can or can't do in Jan and early Feb because the boxes in calendars are comforting, aren't they? When everything else has become so marvelously unboxed. She, talk, she starts talking about quirky things we could do in, instead of a conventional funeral, like perhaps something on a narrowboat, because Gran loved narrowboats. And we both allow ourselves to think that it might happen, just as we did with Uncle Mike's, where the front-running idea was a Viking burial at sea, but ended up being a modest service at Bramcote Crematorium. Gran's funeral is at Bramcote Crematorium, and passes in a fury of pastry, and people who know me but who I don't know. And my nan, so delighted at having outlived Gran, is drunk and feeding scotch and whipped cream off her finger to my cousin's new baby. It's so weird. <laughs> and then the baby is obviously sick, and then my brother is sick because he sees the baby being sick, and he's devastated because these were brand new calots. And to be fair, I understand why they're really lovely calots. All around are pictures of Gran in her youth and middle age her glorious middle age, before she was decked by Peter's death, before her breath got burgled, before her steady deflation. It was this gran I clung to, this gran I was visiting in the QMC, and this gran faded when I was, what, like 12? So I never really knew her then, did I? I was a kid. I had a version of her, and she a version of me. There's two kinds of love, I think. Not romantic and platonic and any of the other ones I can't remember. I don't mean forms of love. 
I mean ways of loving. One is actively, messily, sleeves rolled up and elbow deep in it. Not a back and forth of nothing cards, hers signed by mum, or birthday checks signed by mum. It's a stream of days. It's nappies changed in childhood and then again, much later. The other is in theory from hundreds of miles away where it's safer. I leave because I need to be with people who know my life, can tell the weight of my day from the shape of my spine. You don't have to catch them up on six months or six years in a night in a bizarre rented farmhouse that normally does weddings and the staff haven't quite managed to cover up all of the congratulations on your happy day paraphernalia. There, I'm forever 15, forever son, forever brother, forever he that mucked about in school, forever chav, forever fool, forever boy, never man, always Sammy, never Sam, and gran, forever gran, forever moo. This is a place where everyone's versioned. Knott has no idea who I am. Sausage rolls and brisk nostalgia, sentimental, empty walks. I live in the fog. If I died, I've no idea where you'd put me. Gran's favorite song, I learn at the funeral, is Serenade to Music. I have a Google on the train. What hits me, really hits me, is that Vaughan Williams wrote it for his mates. It wasn't ever meant to be publicly performed. He doesn't list vocal parts in the score. He writes their names. Hello. Haven't done a great deal of chatting for obvious reasons of that it's normally... Oh, yes. There's nothing I like more than a, than a golfing applause like that. That is sick, thank you. Um, genuinely though, thank you, that's really nice. Uh, it's so, the whole like, do we clap after poems thing is such a contentious issue in the poetry world and would take the whole rest of the show to pick apart, so we won't go there, but thanks. Um, what am I talking about? Proper, being in a dark room largely on your own is, is like, I feel like I'm in a sort of Christopher Nolan netherworld where I just like constantly have to rehearse the same piece. I hope it's better than that. I mean, I'm having a really nice time. Shut up, back to the words that you've prepared. I think that's for the best. That was a piece called The Liquid You, um, loosely autobiographical. My name is Ben, not Sam. That's largely it. No, my mum is a lot nicer than that, and I feel bad when I did this piece a few weeks ago and someone was like, do you want to give your mum a quick ring? She was in the audience, and I sort of thought I should clarify that that is a, that is a fiction and that's things dialed up. And also, I think Sam's mum probably is nice. Sam's just a bit of an idiot. Um, anyway, now I'm doing commentary on my own work, so let's move on. Um, I hope you're okay. I hope you're having a nice time. If you're in Wales, I hope you're enjoying your newly unlocked down status, emerging, blinking into the light to find that, yeah, almost everything is still closed. But uh, Nick here told me that 10 pin bowling is back open, so go steady, lads. It's so weird that you can do bowling, but you can't come and watch me. I mean, not culturally, obviously, loads of people would prefer to do the former, but like in, in theory. Anyway, here we are. Um, if you're watching with a partner at home, I hope it's with your established sex partner rather than your casual one. Fucking Matt Hancock is such a specimen, isn't he? The, the weirdest thing about that interview, of which there were so, so many, is the fact that it foregrounded for us with impossible clarity the fact that Matt Hancock has himself had sex, which was fucking frightening. This is, a, I think, a terrible time for nuance in general. Um, not in pandemic messaging, which should probably not have as much nuance as it accidentally has had, but I mean in terms of like our interpersonal relationships. It's obviously shit for everyone, but I think it's a particular kind of tricky for people who have, should we say, untraditional support networks um, beyond uh, an immediate family unit or a, an established single partner. Sometimes that's a choice, obviously, sometimes it's through circumstance, but that um, romantic hinterland is a place that I found myself in from time to time, particularly, uh, particularly acutely during this pandemic, when you could be so geographically close to someone, but so far away, you know, when it's like one rule for them and another rule for us, etc., etc. 
the next chamber opens out onto a picture of an egg at a trestle table in a rose garden in a gilt-edged frame. You didn't think eggs could look entitled until you saw this egg. The egg is called Dominic Cummings. Gone, but not forgotten. And the Rose Garden is at number 10 Downing Street, London, SW1A, 2AA, in case you want to write. This is a piece called Essential Travel, which I wrote after Mr. Cummings' little trip to the Northeast, which I'm sure we all enjoyed as much as me. Essential Travel. If poetry is the transportive art, let it take me to Durham, where I have never been. Let it take me to Coventry. I'm told I have cousins nearby, and Warwick Castle is nice. It is always a glorious day somewhere. If poetry is the transportive art, all I ask is three streets over the turnpike and into the arms of my beloved. Let me kiss skin scarred by all this lack. People are dying without witness, and there is only so long we can believe ourselves loved alone. Let us ask what is essential travel. Let us ask when we'll be home. Next to this is a collage, similarly smug, a small descriptive panel adjacent. This piece is a hybridization and partial erasure of the 24th of September 2020 interview that the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, gave to Sky News regarding the so-called casual sex ban. A 6th of October 2020 interview that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, gave to ITV News in which he suggested that artists, redacted, all people, should consider retraining. And a 12th of October 2020 article in The Guardian about the blanket use of do not resuscitate or DNR orders in care homes during the first phase of the pandemic. The following words are taken exclusively from those sources. It's called DNR. Urgent elderly fears. Unacceptable England developing the scope of its consent. Tell us anonymously. Tell us. Anticipating death can often be painful or dangerous. Welcome pretty shocks to the heart. The daughter of dementia described permission with all the correct charity. Muscular, aggressive, traumatic. Do not resuscitate parts of Wales, the Northeast, the Northwest, Scotland. Where is the help for getting out the door? That money is other bodies. Our generous message to everybody, don't think. Can't pretend that people are people. Local, sad, comprehensive. An enormous amount of, are you self-employed enough? You can't save every cultural beginning. Risk a different job, a fresh and new hard. Musicians, actors, directors, freelancers in the arts, do not resuscitate. So many fabulous emails, putting on different types of performances, carrying on. Casual people smile in these rules. You have to have coin in some parts of the country. You have to define the stick. And I think I'm going to. I was going to. People watching, like six months. People, not people. Following the established bending, I just come back to the playing, downloading the best, the social all, the relationship that anybody can suggest. Say I love you, letter and spirit. <laughs> okay. On the opposite wall, there is a very opposite picture. A portrait of a woman with autumnal hair and a spring smile, sitting on a heath next to a bicycle, the sky closing pink around her. She is, for now, at least two meters away. Though it feels like she's within you. Mounted next to the picture is a long, thin rectangle of text. 
next to which hangs a propagated string of hearts down to the floor. I am building a shrine to your wrists, the way you press the coffee, the life into the morning. There is no one I would rather have been trapped, poor, cold with. I would pay 6,000 pounds to see you do that again. We were trapped, poor, cold in a very beautiful way. That winter of bath breath on the glass, waking up for sunset, knocking on doors in the dark, satellite towns, slow train home. Can I put my head on your shoulder, is this okay? <laughs> Marginal gains. There is no one I would rather have lost an election with. Bought extra layers for your place. Said goodbye for the first time. I hope we never really manage it. There is still red wine on my notebook, this one, from when I sprinted to yours, urgent as a medical drama. Darling, take off my hard socks and hold each of my toes in the three-in-one grill oven microwave combo unit of your palms. Fuck me like we are single glazed. I'll put the kettle on again while you carry the 18th pot from stove to tub. All the better for having taken hours to run. One day, this bath will be full. One day, we will bathe in it. One day, your mother will be allowed to follow me on Instagram. Darling, you are a wall of windows at dawn. You are summer and winter solstice, and one day, we will toast them both. One day, we will go to Seville and make the oranges embarrassed. We will stay in a hotel whose rooms have rooms, and I will love you in each of them. There are no more portraits after that. Something bumps against the bottom of your stomach in your pocket. It's Martin Carter. <laughs> How could you forget him? That bit probably needs a bit of work. You hold him tenderly, as if he is a baby, not a Guyanese poetry legend, 23 years dead. But you'll take intimacy wherever you can get it these days. For a moment, you can't work out how to make him speak. Then you realize you have to playfully wobble his thick framed glasses, which you duly do. A big voice pours out of him, so rich it's as if it's coming from the walls themselves, not this tiny plastic man, which you then realize it is. A poet cannot write for those who ask. Hardly himself, even, except he lies. Poems are written either for the dying or the unborn. No matter what we say. I don't think you're dying. I think you're just getting started. The corridor opens out like a time lapse of a thirsty plant watered. Newness floods in, takes your chest a few seconds to adjust. In the ventricle vestibule, there's an old man sitting on a fold out stool doing the greasy crossword he's discovered at the bottom of his fish and chips. It's the ticket man, 20 years older. He blinks twice when he sees you, then remembers what he's there for. It's free to get in, but it's not free to get out. <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but you can buy a fridge magnet. He laughs like a bicycle pump. <laughs> <laughs> to your surprise, you do buy a fridge magnet. You want to have something to show for it. He puts down his wrapper to serve you, opens the ancient till. Three weeks of headlines bleed together in the grease. Each one meant so much on the day. You can see the clue he's stuck on. Change, he says, and gives you a pound. No, you say. Render. Eight down. Cause to become, make, translate or alter, and present anew. It's, it's render. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, I thought this would be weirder than it has been. It's been really nice and great. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that I'd like people never to come to see stuff. But, I mean, given the circumstances in this unprecedented time, etc., etc., um, it's been really lovely. So thanks to everyone in the actual room. Thanks to the technical team and the artistic team here. They've been legends, made me feel very welcome and very safe, crucially. And thank you to anyone who's watching at home now or in the future present, whenever, wherever you are. If this stays in internet land, I don't know. Anyway, thank you. Hello. Goodbye. Um, I don't have any fridge magnets, but I do have a little poetry book online that you can buy if you want to. Um, it's published by Verve Poetry Press, who are a Midlands-based independent little publishers, and they're amazing, and they'd be just as grateful as me I think for your patronage so if you want to do that that would be sweet um, otherwise just yeah see you later uh, wash your hands wash your bums text your mums good night <laughs>